All right, so it's coming up to Christmas time, right? And it's that time where some of you might be thinking about what Christmas presents am I going to get people? And you want to get the right presents, right? Why do you want to get the right presents? Why do you want to give people the right presents? Satisfy their needs. To satisfy people's needs. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Satisfy people's needs because people got needs. And it's that one time in the year where it's kind of like, you know what, I'm happy to spend some money on you. Um, so it's like, if you're going to spend the money, you might as well actually give people what they really need. Okay, we won't embarrass people, go around the room, find out what presents did you get that, y- that you really thought that you didn't were worthless to you. Uh, it, seems, it seems a waste. Sometimes people give you gifts where you just think, seriously? Um, but do you know what? Um, God isn't like that, right? God the most intelligent being ever would never give a gift that wasn't what you needed, right? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's fair to say. You would never give a gift that is not needed. There's a reason behind everything. And today we're going to look at a different way of thinking about gifts, okay? And what I'm going to say, and I never give away the punchline at the beginning of a sermon, but I'm going to do it today, right? You are the gift, you are the gift, okay? You are a gift that God has given to others, okay? And I would say that we probably don't think that way very often about the way we approach life and the way we approach our relationships with other people. In fact, I would actually go so far as to say I think we might sometimes have a bit of an obsession about other people's gifts, a bit like sometimes there's a, there's a game that Shay's family play in the States where they all get round in a circle and they do this thing. It's a bit like kind of like pass the parcel type thing, type thing. And you end up with presents, right? And you get a present and people look at what you've got and they're like, oh, I wanted that present. And then on the next round, they have the option. They can take that present off you if you want. So you end up with a real good present. You're like, yeah, this is actually something I need. You know, it's like a screwdriver set or something. You're like, yeah, heavy. And then at the next round, someone takes it off you because they're like, no, I need that. And by the end of the game, you're kind of looking at everyone, like kind of thinking like, oh, they got the, the gift that I want. And you get obsessed with the gifts that other people have got. And same way we do that in life. We obsess about other people's giftings, the way that God has gifted other people. And we look at them and sometimes we're like, oh, I wish I was more like them. Or we might be like, I'm not like them at all, so I'm just not going to bother either even trying. Or we look at other people and we're like, I don't think that person is using their gift properly. And what I want us to do today is to think about the gift that we are, that God has given to other people. God, the supremely intelligent gift giver, who would never give anything that isn't needed, and that you are actually needed by other people and God gives you as a gift. But first, let me just pray. Lord God, please help us as we look at your word now. Uh, Help us all to understand it. Help me to teach it accurately. Above all, we pray that you would uh, soften our hearts and open our ears to hear what your word says and that you would change us, make us more like Jesus Christ for your glory. Amen. Okay, so we're in Ephesians, right? And we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians and we got to chapter four, verse seven, okay? And we're gonna see what Paul says to these guys, right? He says in verse seven, but to each what? One, he says, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now you might think, why have you underlined the word one? It's because it's significant because when Paul wrote this, he wrote it originally in Greek, The way he wrote it, there's an emphasis on the word one because he could have said it another way, but instead he puts in the word one there for emphasis and you're like, what's he trying to emphasize? And if you remember the last few weeks, verse four, he said, one body, one spirit, one hope. Then in verse five, he said, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse six, one God and Father of all. And he was trying to make the point of what? Does anyone remember any of the sermons the last few weeks? What was Paul trying to emphasize for the church at Ephesus? The church is one and right, right. And so we need an emphasis on what? Unity. Unity. We need an emphasis on unity, right? And Paul's making a point here, which is interesting because he says to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So what he's doing here is he's explaining that as individuals, 
He's saying, listen up church, as individuals, you've all been given grace by God. You've all been given favour. There's ways that God's blessed you. But he's trying to get the church to not think individualistically. He's trying to get the church to think in terms of one. It's for one. So it's a play on words here in a sense. We say it's for each one of us. He's emphasising the unity. So in other words, God has blessed you so that the church will be blessed. So if you've been blessed by God, guess what? It's so that the church would be blessed. That's why God's blessed you. That's why he's shown you favour. It's so that the church, God's church, would be blessed by the way that you have been blessed. Right? And then check it out. Verse 8, he then says, This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. When he says, This is what it says, does anyone know? what Paul's talking about. What's he referencing here? It's in the Old Testament, right? And he's referencing the Psalms. And your Bible might have a little footnote here where it says, this is why it says, and then it will, that footnote will show you that this is Psalm 68. So, so Paul's chatting about you individuals, us individuals being blessed so that the church is blessed. And he's saying, this is why it says back in Psalm 68. So we turn now to Psalm 68 to see what was on Paul's mind, right? How was the Holy Spirit directing him to talk to us? And we get to Psalm 68, and this is a big one, right? Check it out. The first verse, may God arise, may his enemies be scattered. Okay, this is a big tune, right? It's the way these lyrics are starting, you know this is an anthem, okay? This is a big tune. It doesn't start with... Some like Adele singing something gentle and soft. Like this tune comes in hard, right? And this this would be like one of those tunes, I think, that when you first hear it, you'd be like, ooh, you know, real wake you up on a Sunday morning type song, you know, or for us Sunday afternoon, evening type thing. And it's starting straight away. May God arise and may his enemies be scattered. This is like war talk. This is like end of the world business. Right? This, is, this, is, this is really serious. And it's, it's, it's written for people who know warfare. It's everyday part of life. And they, they want God to destroy all the enemies that cause all the badness. And they want God to change the world that there's total peace everywhere. And that's what this psalm is talking about. And that's what we want, right? That's, that's, we're waiting for God to come back. We're waiting for God to make everything right. Okay? So, so look at the rest of this psalm. In verse 5, it then says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. Verse 10, God, you provided for the poor. Now, it says much more in this psalm, but I just want to give you some of the highlights. Right? It's like the psalm is about God destroying his enemies, bringing about a new world where you've got all these good things happening here. Right? And we all want to see these things happen, right? We, we, we all want to see this. This is the psalm that Paul is using to chat to the church in Ephesus. And he's saying, hey, you lot, you've all each been blessed individually so that this thing happens. So I just want you to look at these verses again. You've been blessed by God so that God may arise and his enemies be scattered so that God would be a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, that God would actually be in our dwelling, yeah, living with us, that, that God would set the lonely in families, in our church family, that he would lead out the prisoners with singing, that we would be singing with prisoners and ex-cons, verse 10, and that God would provide for the poor. In the church, that, that's, that's, that's deep. And the reason why I'm saying this is deep is because this is the end of world anthem. Right? <laughs> this, this is where it's all headed. This is what God's doing. But I'd like to say that I'm guessing most of us were brainwashed in school. And there's lots of good things that came out of school, right? And there's some good things that come out of what I next said. But I think we've been brainwashed into thinking that our individual career path is the most important thing in our life. And I say that as a parent of children on an estate, and I know the statistics. So I know how important education is, and I know how important work is. Having said that, we get brainwashed to think that your individual career path is the most important thing in your life. 
And when we look at this psalm, we're like, no, it ain't. What God's doing is so much bigger than that. Yes, he will use your career path. And there's great stuff about your career path. And the Bible does speak about that. But what we're looking at today is talking about this end of the world business through which God does all these amazing things through the church. Okay, so it suggests we need some renewing of the mind about our career versus our church life. So let's go back into Ephesians, right? Paul says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. So this is from Psalm 68, okay? And it's talking about Jesus ascending on high. When did that happen? At the ascension. So Jesus died at the cross for our sins, right? He died, he was buried. Three days later, he rose again. And then days later, he actually ascended up to the Father's side, right? Ascended on high. And Paul's saying, he's saying, this thing I said to you a lot about, you've all been blessed so that the church would be blessed. That's what this is talking about. This is why Jesus actually ascended. Okay, he ascended. And then it says, he took many what? captives he took he ascended and took many captives and gave gifts to his people so this language that we're getting at now is like the war procession language so in ancient times right you'd have a king who would defeat his enemies right and then there would be a procession back into the hometown into the city right and the king would come with this possession procession and in the procession would be all the captured enemies Right? And they would be in the procession. But not just that, all the things that they'd captured off the enemy, all the gold and all this kind of stuff. And it was a sign, look, the king has won and he's captured all these captives. Right? So now, but when we look at it through the lens of the cross and what Jesus has done, right, and what the rest of scripture says, when it says he took many captives, we know that what this is actually talking about is us. And it's got a deep meaning to it because we were captive to sin and we were captive to Satan. And then Jesus took us. And he's like, you're leaving that army and you're joining my army now. But the thing is, on the one hand, why should you be like, so hang on a minute, are you saying like we're in cages and that we've been captured by Jesus and now we're in cages and we're like prisoners? Well, it doesn't work like that because look at the next bit. It says, and gave gifts to his people. So whereas the king would be like, normally would be like, right, all these gifts, they're mine now, you know? Or like, you heard me yesterday, last Sunday where I was chatting about the British Museum. <laughs> like how we'd be like, well, we're going to put all these things in the museum now, you know, and show them off. Well, well, what Jesus did with us was he was like, right, I've captured you from Satan and from sin, and now... I'm going to give you to my people as a gift. Open up the cages. You're free, but you're not just free. You're a gift to my church. So what that means is if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you've had your sins forgiven, been given a new life by him, you've also been given by God as a gift to the church. You are the gift. So this Christmas when we're thinking, what gifts shall I give people? I'd like you to consider something that you are the gift to the church. God has given you as a gift to the church. And I think this is important because I think a couple of things happen, don't they? Like sometimes you might grow up with people saying, oh, you'll never amount to nothing. You're worthless, you're rubbish. And you need to hear today that God says, you are my gift to the church. I've given you to the church. You're a gift and I'm the supreme intelligence in the world. I'm talking as if this was God here, just, just in case anyone <laughs> drifted off there and was like, whoa. So, so, you know, God's like the supreme intelligent being who says, I choose my gifts very carefully. <laughs> and I'm also renovating you so that you are the ideal gift for the church. It says elsewhere that the Holy Spirit places us how he sees fit. So he's actually said, look, I'm going to place you here. You're my gift. You're my gift to this church. That means you have a value, right? So don't hide, don't hide your gift. Don't hide your gift from the rest of the church because God actually wants you to be a gift to the church. But the other thing that happens is you might not have had anyone tell you you're worthless or anything, but there can be a tendency to think 
that there are some people in the church who are gifted and that you're not. Okay? So, no question about it. Over the years, as Christians, we have overemphasized the gift of teaching. We need Bible teachers for sure, but it's definitely been overemphasized to the, to the point that some people feel like, well, I'm not a Bible teacher. I'm not preaching this Sunday. And sometimes, you know, it's easy for me to say because when I'm preaching, I have to come to church. But sometimes we have that mindset, in it? I'm not preaching today. I'm not going to come to church today. Like you think that the church needs my gift, but doesn't need your gift. The church needs your gift. It needs your gift. And there's things that Bible teachers aren't good at, that people who aren't gifted with teaching the Bible are really good at. And we need everyone. God's gifted us all in different ways. And we so badly need one another. So this Christmas, when you're thinking about gifts, think about how can I be more of a gift to God's church? Are there ways that I hide my gift from God's church? Are there ways that I don't even believe I'm a gift to the church and I need to meditate on God's word and see what he's saying? Now, the next verse, verse 9 says, What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So, so this is the idea that Jesus, first he was in heaven, then he came down to the earth, then he went down into the grave, then he rose again, and then he went up to, to heaven. And one of the reasons why he did this was to save us, to release us as captives, and to make us gifts for the church. And then the next bit, in order to fill what? The whole universe, in order to fill the whole universe. So this is why I say we get brainwashed into thinking our career path is the most important thing. And, and again, I'm not saying your career isn't important and that God won't use your career to do great things. But in scripture, it's actually first and foremost through the church. God fills his church with his glory and from there fills the whole earth with his glory, which means that the gift that you've been given that can serve in your local church, the way that you are a gift to your local church, is part of what ends up filling the whole universe with God's glory. Which means that could actually be more significant than your career path could be. And I just think that's so important because I know, I know that as a society, we don't get that. I know because I've had Christian leaders say to me, like, Duncan, why don't you go to a bigger church? Couldn't you use your gifts at a bigger church? And it's like, that's the, way pe that's the way people think. Or if I've ever done something, achieved something academically, then people are like, so what are you going to do now? Are you going to leave New Life Church? Because you've got that qualification now. Do you think you should? And it's like, well, the church is the way, the plan through which God's going to fill the whole universe. Like, it's all about, it's all about the church. And, and if you think about it, we also think when a church is small, we think, well, that's not very glorious. You need a big church to, to, fill, to fill the world with God's glory. And obviously God uses big churches. He also uses small churches. But in terms of gifts, it does tend to be in the small churches that you do have more opportunity to be a gift to everyone. It's a bit like with football, right? If, you, um, if, you're, a, if you're a goalkeeper and you want to play for a team that already has six goalkeepers in the squad, you're not as needed as the team that doesn't even have a single goalkeeper. In the same way in a small church, we so badly need one another. We need one another more than we actually realize. And the great thing is, is that God has actually given other people to us in our lives because we need one another, but also so that together we can play our small part in filling the world with God's glory. So let's just end with this. If we go back to Psalm 68, right? This is the plan, right? It says, may God arise, may his enemies be scattered. Okay, so this is what we want. We want, we want the demons to be scattered. We want the devil destroyed. We want all the bad people out there that are just doing so much badness. We want an end put to what they're doing. People who are doing genocide, People who are hurting kids, we want an end put to that. 
people who are actually forcing people to have poverty, that people are dying of starvation. We want an end to that, right? And that happens from God arising. And we know that Jesus did that at the cross, but we know that since then, we're constantly lifting Jesus on high, yeah? In our praises, in our conversation, in our lifestyle. And we're putting Jesus on show for the people of Rahampton, the people of Wandsworth, the people of London, to see how glorious Jesus is. And Jesus is building his kingdom more and more until that day when he's going to come back and it's going to be totally perfected, right? And part of that means, verse 5, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, which means in our church, as we live as a gift to one another, this can be a good place for the fatherless. This can be a good place for widows. We know we don't have the resources to put on loads of fancy projects, right? We, you know, we're not going to have the Guardian newspaper writing an article about our church and the amazing projects we run. But, but what's God looking for? A place where the fatherless find out that God is their perfect father and that we reflect that and that us men in the church reflect that to people, that they can see through us what it's like to be a good father that widows are defended, that God is in his holy dwelling, that we're actually a place, a temple for God, where he dwells with us and lives with us, okay? And then the next thing, God sets the lonely in families, that we're actually a church family where lonely people can feel part of a family. And that only happens if we don't hide from one another and don't hide our gifts from one another. And it only happens if we all work together so we're not, There isn't a few of us getting drained, but we're all working together, right? Leading out the prisoners with singing, that we're a bunch of people that sing to God, that we're we're people that either spiritually we know we're prisoners or people who have actually done time, right? And, And that now we know Jesus. And as a result of that, we sing. We sing to God. And then lastly, God, verse 10, you provided for the poor. A church where the poor are actually taken care of this this is God's end game doing it through the church using each one of us so I just want you to hear today that you are a gift to the church yeah and you can be part of this and society will tell you no it's all about your career and your career is important but compared to this this is what's really important investing in this And this is one of the reasons why Jesus died on the cross for you. Not just so that you can be in heaven with him for eternity, although obviously Jesus is really excited about that. Blows my mind, isn't it, that he would be excited about wanting to spend eternity with us. (laughs) But he's just so amazing and so gracious. But, But he also died on the cross to change us and to give us to one another as a gift so that we can be his family doing this, doing the Father's business. And this is what's going to echo for all eternity. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for what you've done at the cross. And we praise you because you released us from captivity. We thank you so much for that. And we thank you so much for the gifts that you have given to us through one another. And we pray that you'd help us to renew our minds to see that we are gifts to one another and to live as gifts to one another and to not obsess about what other gifts other people have got or to obsess about if you think other people aren't using their gifts properly. But help us, Lord, to live as gifts for each other and to play our part in you building your church and building your kingdom And we so much look forward to the day you come back and make everything right. Please help us be faithful stewards in the meantime. In Jesus' name, amen.